Hi everyone. Hi everyone. How's it going? Um, good, good, good to good to join you all on stream. Um, I'm Chris. I'm joining you from Oxford, and I'm really excited to be with you all to celebrate the launch of our new professional development book, Teaching English Pronunciation for a Global World. Um, I'm joined by the authors Robin and Gemma. Hi guys. Hi. Um, and today we're going to be talking all about this topic of pronunciation and why it's so important. Um, but yeah, good, good to have you both join us. How are you doing? Good, great to be yeah, here. Yeah, fine. Yeah, good here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good, 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 good. Um, so before we before we dive into this topic in in a lot of detail, um, I have a quick question for everyone that's watching us in the audience. Um, and I just wanted to ask and, and to get you to think a little bit about what is it that your students struggle with when it comes to pronunciation? And what do you struggle with when it comes to teaching pronunciation? Um, are there particular words that your students struggle to pronounce um, or particular areas of pronunci pronunciation teaching that you might not feel that confident about? Um, just drop your answer in the comments and we'll we'll respond to them in a moment. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear from everyone and hear what what you how you feel about pronunciation, what you feel the challenges are, um, and everything around that. Um, so while you're while you're typing, I'll just introduce what we're talking about today, um, and I'll, I promise I'll stop talking in a second so Robin and Gemma, the actually <laughs> interesting people, can, um, can can share their opinions. Um, so yeah, just to just to introduce what we're talking about. Um, We've run a lot of different events and live streams on the topic of pronunciation before. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience um, will have already heard Robin or Gemma talk about this at some point. Um, if you have, just yeah, let us know where. Um, and we, we've made this argument that pronunciation should be, because we live in a global international world, pronunciation should, we should teach the pronunciation in a way that, that prepares students for this, that helps them be intelligible internationally rather than seeking a specific native speaker accent. We've said this a lot over the past couple of years um, and how we need to prepare learners to speak with non-native speakers as well as native speakers. Um, so you'll have heard a lot about that. Um, but what people have always asked us asked us when we talk about this um, is whether we can give more practical tips and ideas, more, more ideas that we can apply in practice in your teaching right now. Um, and that's really why we're running this session. Um, and it's a large part of this book, I think. Um, Robin and Gemma will confirm that in a second, I'm sure. Uh, but we're here to give you loads of practical ideas and advice that you can apply in the classroom. Um, so yes, we're going to jump in second to, into into um, questions and comments in a second. Uh, before before we jump into the first question, I just wanted to um, share an opinion from Eileen, who who has said that her students have difficulty with ed endings and words. Um, and remembering to pronounce all the endings. So, um, so yes, we've already got people there in the comment um, letting us know. So, yeah, do share your opinions. Um, so, while you share that, yeah, I'm going to ask the um, the first question of Robin and Gemma. Um, so, I suppose the first big question is: We've just published this book that you've written on pronunciation for a global world, teaching English pronunciation for a global world, um, and I want to ask you. What what's different about this book? What what what's inside it that we haven't seen before? Um, what's it about? What does it offer us? Um, I think you almost answer that yourself, Chris, because what the book tries to do is to take into the classroom the sort of learnings that we've picked up over the last twenty years about how pronunciation operates when English is working out there as a language of international communication in which the, the speakers predominantly are not actually native speakers. So we published, AUP published in the year 2000, uh, Jenny Jenkins' absolutely seminal work on, on how pronunciation worked in English as an international language. And then 10 years later, I, I published also with AUP a handbook to explain that, shall we say, in a more user-friendly way, not so much as linguistics, more uh, as a piece of teacher education. But what was missing in the in, in the mix was something that teachers could pick up and use to walk into the classroom tomorrow and have an activity that would work and that would be coherent with the goal that you mentioned earlier of being intelligible as opposed to being closer and closer to some particular native speaker accent. Mm. 
So, that it, it, you know, you come down from straight linguistics, which was uh, Professor Jenkins' work, and you, you drop down into something closer to what I did, which is more like applied linguistics, but you still haven't actually walked into the classroom and said to a teacher, do this. This will help your students become more internationally intelligible. And it obviously, do this with one activity is no good. You need a whole bunch of activities covering quite a range of different areas. And that's where the book came in. And that's what the book's about. Mm -hmm. We cover 10 different areas of the teaching of pronunciation. And we offer use tomorrow activities with step-by-step -step guidance. But all of the activities in the book are coherent with that final aim, which is to make your students internationally intelligible as opposed to all other existing uh, resource books on pronunciation, which explicitly or otherwise are tethered to the native speaker accent. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention as well, you know, it's, we, we say this all the time, but teachers have so little training in pronunciation, how to teach pronunciation in the classroom. And what is out there so far in terms of resources is not preparing students for this international context where they will be speaking with other international speakers. So as, as both of you have said, we're, we're trying to make give teachers the how. They know that we need to do this. We need to think about international intelligibility on the broad global scale, but we haven't taught them how to do this in such a kind of concise book form. So like Robin said, this is full of ways that you can integrate these moments into your class from tomorrow, you know, you pick up the book and you can start using it and working towards this goal, which I think is quite unique. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting and really important too. Um, and I've had a read of it, I, I, I think it's great. Um, so I think you guys have done a really great, a great job with that. Um, you mentioned, you said, you said we need to be offering teachers more practical support. Uh, we need to give them the training that they, that they don't currently have to help students achieve international intelligibility. Um, could you just, just broadly, very briefly, Tell us a bit about some of some of the areas that um, that teachers might need support with. Like, like what 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 ways are there of supporting international intelligibility and promoting um, pronunciation um, that that they that we want to offer them extra support with? Well, I think one of the, one of the things is that you need to know what actually matters when you're aiming towards intelligibility, and what can be left aside is it's an option that you could use. And in, in fact, even some parts of the pronunciation of native speakers that you, you'd want to avoid teaching your students because they don't contribute to intelligibility. So this is, you know, this is quite different to what's gone before because we're actually saying, OK, we, we're not trying to teach towards an accent. We're teaching towards intelligibility and we have quite a clear idea as to which features of pronunciation contribute most to your intelligibility. And that's important for teachers for different reasons. A, because actually the, the number of features that contribute positively towards intelligibility is uh, quite limited compared to the number of features that characterize native speaker pronunciation. Um, so they, they need to know which ones to go for. And, and also they need to know which ones to avoid. And mm. interestingly, if you look back through course books over the last 20 years, a lot of time when they do pronunciation exercises is spent on features of pronunciation which are absolutely typical of native speaker speech, but which don't contribute positively to intelligibility. Mm, that's for, example, for example, weak forms. There are so many exercises in course books getting students to do weak forms when in fact to be intelligible, you'd be better off not doing them. You'd be better off giving the correct stress pattern to a word, but avoiding uh, excessively reducing the vowels, uh, even to the point where they disappear. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. quite liberating. It's, it's quite liberating when you realize what you have to teach for intelligibility, because immediately we are reducing down the amount of features that we have to concern ourselves with in the classroom. We don't have to teach every single sound of English. We can focus on this very refined core of features and know that in, in, in you know, integrating them into our classrooms and into our lessons, we will be having a very specific, clear effect for our students and their spoken English. 
I, I, you know, I mean, something else which I think is really important about this intelligibility approach to teaching pronunciation. Well, two things. The first is, if you, if you are successful, you're intelligible to people who use English all around the world, and that is like one and a half billion people. Mm. So, you know, the 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 the, the, the sort of uh, payoff for making the effort of working on these features, which are are important for intelligibility, is is wow. I, I'm in touch with so many people. I can speak and they understand me. Isn't that fabulous? But the other thing that's really important about an intelligibility approach is that it doesn't it's not limited to teachers who have a specific accent mm. the approach is wide open to anybody of any accent native speaker or re regional non-native speaker it's open to anybody who knows through their own use of english that when i speak with my accent people understand me that is i am intelligible and if you know through your own experience of your use of english that you're intelligible then you are the perfect model for your students. Mm. And that empowers so many teachers who previously, uh, for example, uh, as non-native speakers would say, I don't have the accent on the recording, I dare not teach pronunciation because I just don't have a good enough accent. <laughs> or you're a native speaker with a regional accent. Hello, Gemma. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you say, I can't teach pronunciation with my accent. It's not at all like the one on the recordings. All of that disappears. Mm. And suddenly you empower hundreds of thousands of teachers around the world. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing they need to be sure of is when I speak in English, people understand me. And once you're sure of that, then fine, you're set up to go into the classroom. Mm. Mm. I love that. I think it, it it is such an interesting approach. I think I think it is absolutely the way the way we need to be following things. Um, so I just wanted to say to everyone in the audience, um, because we're getting loads of loads of lovely comments through, loads of people saying hello. Um, if you have any questions at all about pronunciation, um, if you if you have any any thoughts or queries, do just oh, drop them in the comments. I want to like. pick up on one in the chat, uh, yeah. Chris. And it's from Rocio Romero, and she says, this is an excellent approach, but there are institutions that still require American or British varieties in the classroom. Mm. It's very interesting if you take a look at the, uh, the evaluation systems for international exams. So this could be IELTS and it could be Cambridge, it could be Trinity, there's a whole range of international exams. And when you look at their descriptors for, for good pronunciation in the oral part of their exams, the reference to a standard American accent, North American accent, or to a standard UK accent is simply not there. These major players in the business of English language teaching all refer to the candidate's intelligibility. And so there may be one or two institutions out there which are still hanging on, perhaps because they feel that this is where good pronunciation lies. But I think the, the ball is very much in the other court now. And for example, institutions like the British Council absolutely do not demand specific native speaker uh, varieties in, in the classroom in terms of pronunciation. Mm. Mm. But I, I do I do also agree it's a really interesting point that there are some institutions that um that have this perspective and this is while it's something that's that's changing, it's something that does need to continue to change. We need to we need to move more towards this model and keep going. I am definitely. Absolutely. There's another interesting comment from um Alexandra as well, Alexandra was talking about weak forms. Shouldn't we at least teach students weak forms so they can be better listeners? And mm -hmm. that's a great point. And I think what Robin and I were trying to get at was when we're you know, teaching students to produce English and we're teaching them productively, mm -hmm. um, it's not really a great use of our time to spend that time focusing on making reduced vowel sounds or making students do connected speech in English, but certainly from a receptive point of view, and we talk about this in the book, 
it is useful to have those conversations and those lessons where we are making students aware of these features of English, um, in, in particular used by um, native speakers or highly proficient speakers that they're going to hear in films, in you know, on podcasts. So for sure, receptively, let's talk about it, let's introduce them into the classroom. But for intelligible, productive speech, they aren't necessary. I mean, that, again, that's, that's something that's unique about the book. We make an absolutely clear difference between what you need to be able to do, so this is your productive competence, and what you need to be able to deal with as a listener, so that's your receptive competence. And in the past, that simply wasn't touched by books. They, 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 there was no need to, because everybody would end up speaking with the same accent, and therefore we, we understand everything. Well, no, that doesn't work like that. Everybody speaks with an accent and you need to be able to deal with those. And native speakers will speak with an accent and a large part of that accent will have weak forms and, and vowel reductions and other connected speech features and they're not going to go away. And you certainly couldn't ask the native speaker to make them go away. So as a listener, you have to be able to deal with them. And that produces this, this, this separation of your uh, productive from your receptive skills. I wanted to, I saw questions, oh, there's so many amazing questions going yeah, on. They're all coming through. I wanted to come to one, a uh, very quick one from uh, Beata in Poland, and she was saying, <laughs> how can a non-native speaker learn to teach pronunciation? And, and for me, in my experience, these last 35 years here in Spain, what I discovered was that my non-native speaker uh, trainees or teachers actually were far better uh, situated to teach pronunciation. Virtually all of them had a very good grounding in phonetics and phonology because of the, degree, the degrees that they'd done in order to become teachers. So I didn't have to explain what a fricative was or uh, all of the sort of ins and outs and bits of pronunciation. They already had this. But the other thing that was really interesting as an advantage that a non-native speaker teacher has over uh, native speaker teachers is that very often the teacher is in a room full of students who are beginning from the same, the shared mother tongue. Mm. Therefore, the teacher has made the journey that he or she is asking the, the students to make. And that is incredibly useful. Hi, hi guys, I, I know this is difficult, but look at me, I'm your stupid teacher and I've managed. If I can, <laughs> you guys can manage, but I do know some tricks because I had to learn them in order to get to the end of the road. So I'm going to shortcut on my journey and allow you to get to the end of the road quicker. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help you do my journey, but it's going to take a lot less pain and a lot less time. And uh, I think and it's important to, to you know, it's a bit like if you want to climb Everest, who do you want next to you guiding you? Somebody who was born in Nepal or somebody who's been twice on the summit of Everest? I think it's also important to, to consider the, the teacher as a role model as well, because if the teacher has been through this journey, it gives students this natural role model right in front of them from the word go. This is what you can achieve. It doesn't matter that we're not native speakers. I started where you are and this is what you can accomplish as well, um, which is, is really important and it can be very motivating to see that that is possible. Wonderful. Thank, thank you both. No, I, I, I absolutely love that. Um, I'm just scrolling through. I'm getting it's, yeah, it's, it's very too. hard to pick which ones. Um, I want to I want to go a bit basic here. There's one that yeah. came up earlier. Um, and I think I think there's actually two which I think um, which I think are really interesting. And I'm going to show them both. One is from Eileen, which is where should we begin yeah. in regards to pronunciation teaching? Yeah. Like if, we, if we're going to start at the very beginning, what's the first step? Uh, yeah, Eileen, this is really interesting because when I was taught pronunciation, we started with, with individual sounds and we went through all of the sounds and then you're allowed to make them up into words and then you learn about word stress and things like that. At this point, after 40 years in the classroom, pronunciation for me begins with words. When I introduce new vocabulary to my students, I notice some of the words are far more difficult for them to pronounce intelligibly than other mm -hmm. words. And I often light upon the, those words that are causing difficulty. And possibly that day, and possibly also some other day, I go and work on what is difficult about that word. 
So that it's the other bit of language learning that presents pronunciation problems. But as I say, I start with words. And then sometimes those words might lead to us examining a specific sound. Um, typically, for example, my students always had Spanish as their first language. It's the only country I've taught in. And the J sound in January, July, June is really difficult for them. So words with that sound would tend to produce, oh, we need to work on this sound again. And the word has dragged me to an individual sound. But words can also take me towards learning about word stress. And words can also then build up into sentences. Um, and there might be some work on linking words that comes up. Mm. Or there might be some words on uh, work on which words in the sentence seem to be stressed more than other words in the sentence. But as I come now to the end of my career, words are the beginning point of my work on pronunciation. That's really interesting. But you know, this is one of the most common questions that were asked um, routinely. You know, I work in a university, teachers would come into the uh, administrative office and look at all the teaching books and resources and they'd say, I know I need to teach pronunciation, but I don't know where to start. You know, we, we, we've raised people's awareness that it's important, but they don't know where to begin. And they say, what should I do first? Um, and I think Robin's approach is so authentic and so normal that, you know, we can observe our students on a, just a normal day to find the features they need help with. Um, but if you wanted to do something that was more strategic and more comprehensive, you could even run a little diagnostic test at the beginning of your course, hmm. asking students to make a recording of themselves reading a paragraph mm -hmm. and emailing it to you or sending it to you for you to listen to and actually, you know, listen a couple of times and identify areas which they're struggling with. Um, but I think either of these ways allows you to observe students um, and, and choose what they need based on their pronunciation as they are when they're in the classroom with you. And that's really important. You know, Gemma, sometimes when my students sent in recordings for marking, and obviously the stuff I'd chosen was targeted towards things they might find difficult, and sometimes they break off from English with a word that was really difficult. And in Spanish, they would say, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be on the recording. And it was great because you're getting this very intimate sort of feedback, you know, we can't do this. And, and then, of course, what's really interesting, whichever way you do it, oh. live in class or through recordings, what's come up is what the group are finding difficult. And the minute you say, perhaps, next week uh, on Monday in the class, we could dedicate 20 minutes to this. The answer is always, yes, please. So yes. what you've generated, first of all, is you've highlighted, you've done your little diagnostic test one way or the other. And the second thing is you've generated <coughs> massive motivation because they themselves mm -hmm. think, we can't do this. And then you step in. And it, it, it totally alters the way they perceive pronunciation. It's the answer to their problems. It's not an added problem which is the way it's, it's often happened in the past, that it's been running parallel to your classes as a sort of, you've got your four skills and then we do pronunciation work and grammar and vocabulary. So it's like seven streams in your class and it's just an added problem. I'm struggling already with definite articles and my teacher now wants me to make the difference between these two sounds. That's an added problem. The way we've just talked through actually is taking problems away, it's solving problems. And that obviously increases motivation. I don't know about you, Robin. I mean, I've never come across students who say we don't want to do practice of our pronunciation. We don't want your feedback. That's never happened to me. Has it happened to you? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> to be honest, well, perhaps it did at the beginning, but at the beginning, I was so lost teaching pronunciation <laughs> that I basically transferred what I was doing in the university as a student of English to what I was doing in class as a teacher of English. But in the university, I was doing phonetics and phonology. Yeah. And so it, I wasn't actually solving problems for them. I was getting too tied up in my newfound knowledge of how English pronunciation works. And I'm turning that into classes. And that's, that's not the class they need. Um, but that's certainly not at the level I was working with, with my students. I think that's what I, I feel about the book in terms of problem solving. Um, and I've said this before, the book is what I wish I had when I started <laughs> teaching because I didn't have a clue. I, like everyone, I, like so many people had zero training 
or such limited training that I only made a fool of myself. I only embarrassed myself with my so limited knowledge. But the the, the, the problems we are also trying to solve in the book is to give you, to give teachers just small techniques that they mm. don't need any resources for, they don't need to prep yeah. for, things yeah. they can do on the board, things they can do with a whole class that yeah. will try and, and answer these questions and solve these problems. So yeah, Robin, why didn't we write this 20 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, things get written when they, I mean, yeah, it was interesting it. because when we did yeah. sit down to write it, it came out incredibly quickly because it seems to have been just sort of maturing itself and waiting and waiting for the moment and then the moment arrives. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm sitting yeah. looking at a quest at a, at a comment from Alexandra my oh god I gotta change my glasses. Capuchina <laughs> Capu I can't pronounce it. I'm really sorry. A vowel a lot of vowel sounds seem to be problematic for my students, especially the short vowels. Mm. Yeah Alexandra they are and, and for my students as well if you if your student's mother tongue doesn't have a long vowel short vowel distinction this is going to be a major um, headache um, and unfortunately the the sort of vowel length issue is important for intelligibility so it's not one of those headaches um, such as weak forms that you can say well I'm not going to do it because it's not important uh, it is important and as I say my students all had Spanish as a, as a first language and there is nothing to do with vowel length there that relates to the way vowel length is or is modified in English so um, that's the, the, the bad news um, that you have to deal with this issue some help some basic stuff they first of all have to perceive the differences so you do need to do quite a lot of listening work where they're trying to decide, did they hear the, the long version, the short version? And I'm not just talking about things like uh, live and leave. I'm also talking about things like uh, back and bag. Mm. So back, you know, the thing behind me here, and bag, the thing I carry there. Um, that's really important in English. And again, my students initially, because it's not a feature of Spanish phonology, they just didn't hear the differences. So you have to do a lot of work with them until they're perceiving that difference. And then the other thing is it's useful to marry the actual length difference to something physical mm -hmm. that you can do with them and that they can do for themselves. So that if I wanted the short, uh, the short sound, as in the part of my body, I would go back. And I had this little thing of my hands close together and I go, back like that and then for the longer one i pull apart as if i had a rubber band in my hand and i go bag and then i get my students to physically do it um because what we're doing is using different intelligences and that physicality the kinesthetic mm -hmm. it actually connects through and helps them to to remember back bag and yeah, another that like that that so, physical element is so helpful, so enriching. Um, while we're on, um, while we're on the topic, um, at the start, I asked everyone to um, to say what their students found challenging about pronunciation, um, and we've addressed one. I just want to, I just want to show, share some of the others, and then, um, and then, Robin and Robin and Gemma, you can, you can sort of address the ones that that, that stand out to you. But um, just to share them, the first one we had. Um, Marissa has, has told us that her students have problems linking sounds from one word to another. Um, Alexandra mentioned vowels. Someone else mentioned vowels. Um, Eileen has mentioned difficulties with ed endings to words as well, um, and remembering to pronounce all the endings. Um, there's there's loads of these. Someone has asked, "What about intonation?" Um, and we've we've had a couple other comments about intonation as well. Um, intonation is the most difficult aspect of English. Um, and then, of course, there's some specific stuff. There's a comment here, those sounds in English that don't exist in Spanish cause the most trouble. It's hard to retrain the brains of adults. Um, so, yeah, we've got actually lots of different problems that people have. Can we go back to the first one in that case and then go through yeah. these one by one? Because you've flashed on. through them there and I can't remember them. My old brain is, you know. <laughs> Gemma, any um, thoughts? Well, uh, great news, Marissa. They don't have to. 
They don't have to link from one word to the next. Uh, that's something that we address in the book that connected speech, which is in so many of our textbooks, so many of our course books, and which is so foreign to so many people. Um, you don't have to get them to produce it. It isn't necessary for intelligibility. Um, as we mentioned before, you can teach it if you want to talk about um, receptive, you know, listening for pronunciation. They may hear it from other speakers, so it's helpful to decode it and learn about it in that respect, but they don't have to produce it to be intelligible. Uh, in fact, one thing that we find, and um, Robert and I talk about a lot, is that um, these are one of these features which actually reduce intelligibility. It doesn't increase it. So I think that's hopefully a good thing for you that they don't have to worry about producing this aspect mm, absolutely um let's go on to eileen's comment which is that her students have difficulties with the ed endings of words and remember to pronounce all the endings it was the it was the first comment that i picked up on from the from the chat box there you, you, we've it's, already commented. it goes right back to the beginning we've for me already I mean, commented on that no but i i loved it you know because I go, oh, wow, this is really interesting pronunciation. I'll do this with my students. Well, it's not that interesting for your students. Uh, it's pretty weird to have to say a, a, an infinitive in your head and then decide if it's voiced or if it's not voiced and if it's voiced the dirt and if it's not voiced the dirt and so on and so forth. Eileen, the most important thing is that they should mark something. And if it's a dirt rather than a dirt or a dirt rather than a dirt, it doesn't matter they they've actually voiced the marker of pastness that would be my 15 years ago answer to your question my today answer to your question is it absolutely doesn't matter even if they don't pronounce them because the pastness is elsewhere and if you actually start listening seriously to native speakers on reputable programs such as you might get on the bbc radio or Tons and tons and tons and tons of times, native speakers do not mark any of these, neither t nor d nor id, because they're in the middle of conversation and they tend to get chopped off to facilitate speech. So, you know, if you want to go really deep in, don't bother about it at all. If you want them to pronounce one of the three, make sure that they pronounce one of the three and therefore mark the past nature of the verb. But the, these exercises of was it uh, t, was it dirt, was it id, they're wasting their time. They're, mm. they're, they're actually going accent rather than intelligibility. That's really interesting. Um, I've actually, there's, there's been a bunch of, as soon as we started talking about that, we had a bunch of people say the same comment in different ways, which I think is really interesting. Um, we've had Claire mention that French speakers have difficulty pronouncing the S on the ends of words. Yeah. Julie has mentioned that TH sounds in Dutch don't exist. So thought and taught are often pronounced the same. Um, and almost at the same time, um, Maria said um, pronouncing the thus sounds in English drives her Italian students crazy as it doesn't exist in the native language. <laughs> um, so how, how would you address these kinds of issues? Well, the third one is pretty easy because that is a sound that um, is changed by so many speakers, whether they're native or non-native. If we look just at the UK, for instance, um, so many people swap th for th, so they'd say free instead of three. Mm. Um, if we went to um, Ireland, where they don't have the th either, many people would say t rather than th. Um, and what we know is that um, these sounds are not hugely important for intelligibility because lots of people are replacing th with other sounds and still being perfectly easily understood. So that's that's very low on our list of priorities, that th sound, that dental fricative. It's not something that students need to worry about or spend a lot of time worrying about because it's not going to have a huge influence or a huge effect on their international intelligibility. Mm. And we can see that. We can see that among among all of us native speakers. We we can all understand one another regardless of the th or the instead of th. I mean, one of the interesting things uh, about this intelligibility approach is that uh, at least for the consonants, certain consonants clearly have variations as you travel around the world, and these variations are all intelligible. So the, the same is true with uh, the R sound. So, you know, when I'm back in the northeast of England, then I'm, I'm Robin with R. But if I go over into Scotland to the family there, I'm Robin. And it's a trill. 
and it's completely intelligible. I don't get confused about who they're talking to when I'm traveling between Northumberland and Scotland. Mm. Um, so it's, it's interesting that certain sounds actually, as we take a, a global look at how pronunciation works, certain sounds of English do offer variations and they're all valid because they're all intelligible. Mm. And the, the TH sounds, the voiced and voiceless TH sounds, are the consonants that have most variation as you travel around the world. And therefore, if we know that to say this, this thing, this thing is big and not this thing, um, mm. if, if we know that this is intelligible and your students find it incredibly difficult to actually do the dental fricatives, as by the way, do native speaker kids as they're learning English, it's the last consonant that they learn to pronounce properly. So if we know that this is difficult and we know that they can produce a totally valid and intelligible alternative, then let, let them do the alternative and use your time on something else. Everybody says, when we say, do some more pronunciation work, they all say- We don't have time. time. Yeah, one of the <laughs> guys don't have time. If you spend all your time trying to get them to do dental fricatives, or trying to get them to do absolutely perfect vowels as, as if they'd been born in Buckingham Palace, <laughs> then you won't have time. Mm. If you try to get them to do what really matters, you, you're going to have time you, you, because it's going to have a, such a positive effect on their pronunciation. That yeah. makes sense. Well, pick, pick. Oh, sorry, Gemma, go on. I was just going to, to add to that. Um, and, and something that, that we talk about in the book is, you know, if, if, if a student is desperate for a native speaker accent, mm. you know, we're not saying don't do it. You know, no. the students are allowed to choose their goals. But if if after they have reached international intelligibility, that is a sound they want to work towards, fine. But yeah. they've already reached this level of intelligibility where people will understand them mm. first before they then start pushing for this perfect dental fricative. Um, so they're gaining regardless of whatever you do, if you're working towards international intelligibility or they then go and progress on towards their own goal of, of an L1 accent. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, you were both talking just then about um about the importance of instead of instead of focusing on getting perfect pronunciation with certain certain features and certain phonemes, um, instead focusing on. So I need to stop you because we 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 all default this way. You said getting perfect pronunciation. So what are we when you say perfect? What's perfect? Perfect for well, me yes. is the pronunciation that works. For the situation in which you you find yourself yeah absolutely absolutely well no yeah but exactly. it's, it's quite important because a lot of teachers will say but i want my students to have good pronunciation yes so do i <laughs> i want my students to have the best pronunciation and the best pronunciation the perfect pronunciation is the pronunciation that is highly intelligible to the people you're speaking to at that mm. particular time mm which in fact is not automatically native speaker pronunciation, which is the default idea of perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that does. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Um, oh, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Um, OK, yeah, that was it. So, so instead of focusing on individual features, which might not be the most productive, um, you, you mentioned wanting to, you mentioned that it is more important to focus on those areas which are going to contribute to intelligibility most yeah. effectively. Um, and right at the start, we had a, um, a question from Bibi, I hope I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. that correctly, which is what features should we be focusing on to enable intelligibility? So could you go into a bit more detail about what those features are? You're gonna do this, Gemma. I've done this so many times. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, sure. I will interrupt and correct you. <laughs> you can, you can absolutely do that. Um, so the features that we talk about and that we certainly share in the book uh, come from the Lingua Franca core, which considers all consonants, apart from this this th, this dental fricative sound, all consonants are important for intelligibility. Consonant clusters, particularly those at the beginning or in the middle of words, a consonant cluster is when we have those consonants one after the other after the other with no vowels between them. Um, we say that vowel length or vowel duration is more important for intelligibility than getting that perfect vowel quality. So Robin, Robin demonstrated before that difference with back and bad. Um, that's something that we know from research is important to be intelligible. Um, we talk about 
nuclear stress, that's also called tonic stress, and that is helping students to hear and produce the most stressed word in a phrase or in a sentence. We do also talk about word stress um, because we think that you know, teaching students about word stress is a very easy way to introduce the concept of stress. And I think that word stress is something that we all anecdotally observe in the classroom and we notice when it's misused or mispronounced and causes a communication breakdown. So we also talk about that in the book as well. Robin, what have I missed out? Uh, nothing really. I think that's Whatever. it. I mean, yeah. for me, there's four areas. Yeah. So it's these consonants, except the dental fricatives, the TH sounds. But also, er has variation, so students can use the trill as in Robin uh, and be perfectly understood. Um, the intonation, a lot of people in the, in the chat are asking about intonation. Intonation, you need to clarify in your own minds that there are different aspects to intonation. One which Gem has mentioned, which is which word in an utterance is most stressed. And often in course books, we call that sentence stress. Mm. And that is really important because if someone speaks and stresses one word, the listener will go to that word. And if they stress the wrong word in an utterance, the listener will focus on the wrong word and construct meaning from the wrong word. And therefore the communication is threatened. But the other side of intonation, which are the tones, you know, the, the, the fall tone, the rising tone, and, and uh, rise, fall, and fall rise, which are the four basic tones of native speaker English, and which are absolutely horrific to teach, and have very, very, very low success rates. Um, well, they don't contribute to international intelligibility. And there are many instances of all sorts of tones being used, which wouldn't, in my case, I listen and I go, wow, I wouldn't have used that tone there. But you realize that tones contribute very little to international intelligibility. And therefore, basically, you can drop from your course book all of the exercises on was it a rise, was it a fall, um, because they're not essential. So intonation, two parts. The tones, forget them. And use your limited time elsewhere. The sentence stress or nuclear stress, yeah, work on it because very few languages actually use nuclear stress in the way that English does in order to create different meanings. Mm. So that if I say, I love teaching physics and I've stressed love, I'm demonstrating how strong is the positive feeling I have when I'm teaching physics. I love teaching physics and I stress teaching. Then what I'm doing is, is saying, but you know, like, learning or, or some other thing that you might do with physics, I don't enjoy that as much, studying physics. It's teaching that I really like. I love teaching physics as opposed to chemistry, as opposed to biology. I love teaching physics, but the other guy in the, in the department, he really hates it. He prefers teaching chemistry. By changing your sentence stress, your nuclear stress, in English, you totally change the meaning. And that is not common in many other languages and that is why teaching nuclear stress is so important for intelligibility. Mm. And I think it's important as well to consider that um, if you are teaching uh, intonation, attitudinal uh, intonation, you know, um, in, uh, where students have to infer meaning based on a tone, um, that usually takes a native speaker model and native speakers break that oh, all the time. time. You know, um, a native speaker will have a falling tone to convey this, but a rising tone to convey that. If you actually look at studies where, where we've examined this, um, native speakers break that rule all the time. So it's not always even accurate to be following a native speaker model if you wanting to teach about intonation to signify an attitude uh, or infer meaning. Um, I think using, as we've said, you know, nuclear stress or tonic stress um, does a far clearer job of that and it's easier for us to teach. Absolutely. I'm just looking at something in my, my chat box as it is from Suzanne Franks, um, University of Illinois School of Literatures, Cultures and Linguistics, and she's thanking us for helping them figure out how to do what they've been talking about for the last eight years. That is <laughs> fabulous. That is 
you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to sleep really well tonight because this is exactly what we want to do with the book. You know, uh, Gemma and I know each other through the IATAFL pronunciation special interest group. And we've also been talking about intelligibility as a goal for 20 years now or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also were conscious it's not enough to be talking about it. Teachers actually need to be helped to walk into the classroom equipped to be able to teach towards this goal. And we, we can't expect them to do all the experimenting. I did loads of stuff with my students who I probably ought to go and find and pay the money back because I was <laughs> experimenting with them. But I, I had the time, I had the situation, I was very privileged. Most of us don't. And that's why the book's really important. So you can actually take this focus on intelligibility and walk into the classroom knowing you're equipped to be able to do it on a day-to-day -day basis with your students. Yeah, it's the how. Yes. The how. We're giving people the how. Yeah. Um, while we're on the topic of the book, I do I do just want to um, to give a shout out to it and, and um, tell everyone how to get hold of it. Um, so this book, Teaching English Pronunciation for a Global World, um, the, Robin and Gemma have done an absolutely great job here. Um, as they've said, this 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 book contains all that all the how to. It really it really does go into a lot of detail, um, a lot more detail than we've talked about today about all all of the the most practical approaches to pronunciation teaching. Um, so we've included two links down in the comments. Um, one is a link to our catalog, uh, where if you want the book, if you if you can't wait, if you want it right now, um, head there. It's it's available now. It's in stock, so you can go and buy it. Um, I know there's a print book available there now. The ebook may be, uh, it, it may be there now, or it may be added in like a week or so. So check back if that's what you want. Um, make sure to keep checking that page if you want an ebook. But um, if you if you want a print book, that is available to purchase now. Um, and if you want to find out more about the book, um, there's a second link in the comments to a sample chapter. Um, I believe it's the chapter on vowels um, is the sample chapter we're offering. So if you if you want to, and it, it may have some stuff on consonants as well. Um, so if you, if you want to learn more about, about that in some detail and get a taste of what else might be in this book, um, go have a look there. Um, and yeah, that sample chapter should give you all the details you need. You just need to fill out a form and you'll get a link straight to it. Um, so yeah, please do go and get a hold of that. Um, and yeah, we, we hope you enjoy it. Um, so yes, yeah, those links are down in the comments and, um, and while you guys are grabbing that, we'll continue answering your questions. Um, there is one that I wanted, in, unless there's, um, if either, if any have jumped to either of you, let me know. But there was one which I thought was really interesting, um, which is a bit different. Um, so someone has asked, many students feel a pressure from teachers, tests or society to sound like native speakers. Are there any tips for helping them challenge this notion in their own speaking? Yeah, I'll let them... <laughs> The other day, I walked into my local climbing shop, mountaineering shop. They supply stuff for, for sports in the hills. And they said to me, watch this guy. He's British. He's talking. It's about skiing. We know about skiing. What's he saying? We know some English, but we can't get what he's saying. And I listened, and I thought, I'm not surprised you can't get. And, and the subtitles were coming up totally wrong. He just wasn't intelligible. So actually sh letting students see people speak in different, from different uh, mother tongue backgrounds so that they can contrast people speaking um, who are not native speakers and um, contrast them against native speakers. Very often they're going to find that the person I understand best wasn't the native speaker. The native speaker was really hard to understand. So raising this awareness with, with authentic material taken off the internet um i think that that's a good letting students discover also asking students for their own examples because any students that has traveled will have been in that situation my own students w would go to birmingham through the erasmus program and on a friday night they'd have their parties and they said it all was fine but we couldn't understand the native speakers in the party and they couldn't understand anyone else in the party so my students all had, the minute I said, you know, have you ever had this experience where it was hardest to understand the native speaker? They all have had that experience. And, and, and this is sort of, goodness, what is happening here? Why should we be able to understand other people who are not native speakers? It's becoming conscious. 
oh goodness, the native speakers are doing something that it, it, it sometimes can be a problem. It's not every native speaker. It's not every time a native speaker speaks. But it's just bringing out this reality that a native speaker is speaking in the way that is suited to the people they are normally talking to who are fellow na native speakers. And that's totally correct. That's the way we, we communicate with each other we, and we identify with each other. Many native speakers are not very good at actually adapting how they pronounce in order to be internationally intelligible. Whereas virtually all of the people who learn English as an additional language have that ability to move around and to be more intelligible according to who they're listening to. This, this actually ties into a comment from a, a teacher called Ricardo Busseto. And he's saying, can you define intelligibility universally? No, you, you, you can't. Intelligibility is something uh, ad hoc. It's worked on by people who are in a conversation. But it's interesting to see that very often the non-native speakers are more able to quickly reach ways of pronouncing that are intelligible to each other and therefore keep the conversation afloat. Mm -hmm. I find with my students, they blame themselves. You know, they get their IELTS 6.5, they come to the UK to do their university studies, they get off the plane and immediately they cannot understand anyone. Um, and they think it's it's their fault. They think it's their fault that they are just not good enough, that they, oh my God, I immediately have to enroll in another English course because clearly I'm, I'm just not able to understand native speakers. It's, it's something I need to change, whereas a lot of the time this is something that native speakers really need to change um mm -hmm. they need that same training that we're all we're suggesting for our students they need to know how to make themselves internationally intelligible how to uh, accommodate for speakers from different backgrounds in different countries um so what what we're saying is not just for our students international intelligibility is something that everyone Everybody. could get better yeah. at so that we're all communicating more clearly absolutely I seem to remember that there was a company um, based in York initially that worked specifically on business English and that they now work out of London. And what are, one of the things they do is to train British business people so that they are more internationally intelligible for when they, they go outside the aisles in order to do international work and, and contracts. It's because you're born a native speaker of English, it does not mean that your pronunciation will automatically be internationally intelligible. In fact, it, it's possible that you will need, as Gemma suggested, you're going to have to start modifying your pronunciation in order to be intelligible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one question which is kind of, um, we, we were talking a lot about, about encountering different um, accents and, and different language mm. backgrounds. Someone's mm. asked, do you have particular advice for helping non-native speakers of different L1s understand each other? But this is what this whole book is about. <laughs> yes, that so, is a good point. Yeah, this is <laughs> exactly based on that. It's based on the study of what happens when non-native speakers from different L1 backgrounds come together and which features are common to all successful pronunciation amongst mm -hmm. these non-native mm -hmm. speakers. And by doing this analysis, you finally come up with what men, uh, Gemma mentioned earlier, which is the lingua franca core, which are those four key areas that are, are shared by all people who are internationally intelligible. It doesn't mean that a particular combination might not produce more difficulty. Um, so, you know, I mean, there are so many languages around the world that it's impossible to say that, you know, you, you, you become competent in the four areas and that's it. You're never going to have any problems. It's not like that. Um, but those individual one-offs, that, that particular L1 with that particular other L1, they can be dealt with when they arise. Mostly, if you are competent in the elements of the lingua franca core, which, by the way, is really nicely detailed in the book because so many people are still not fully aware of, of what it is and how it works. So there's a very, very full description of the lingua franca core. And these are the things that you have to prioritize and teach and your students have to be competent at producing. But basically, if your students do reach full competence in the lingua franca core, they will have very, very few problems. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, I suppose we, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, there's one that stands out to me. Robin or Gemma, were there any, any left that you particularly wanted to answer? I'm just having a look through. Well, I'm, I'm seeing one from Diego who's coming back to weak forms. I feel yes. I must teach connected speech and weak forms because it's the way 400 million native speakers speak. Yeah, this is this is correct, Diego, but you have to make that separation between productive competence and receptive competence. And so what your students need in order to be able to uh, understand and communicate with the native speakers is the ability to hear and understand speech that is characterized by weak forms and reduced vowels. But it certainly is not recommended that they your students produce these weak forms or reduced uh, these weak forms or reduced vowels themselves because in the long term in a, in, a, in the big world with one and a half billion uh, interlocutors th those features will not help them be intelligible so yes prepare your students for contact with native speakers but that would be prepare them so that they understand native speaker speech characterized by weak forms and connected speech features yeah I, I had to I had to scroll through to find Diego's comment there. There's there's been so many. Everyone's asked so many questions. It's hard to it's hard to find them. Um, um, no, another I, one that, that if if we can just to to finish off with Claire Zanetto has asked. Claire said, "Are you suggesting that we don't teach vowel sounds, um, mm. just vowel length? We're not saying don't teach vowel sounds. We're saying that for to to prioritize for maximum intelligibility." Um, vowel length, the duration of those vowels is is more important. We're not saying don't teach them, but if you have limited time, um, as we all do, then then that getting that length distinction right between vowel sounds is going to make your students more intelligible. But we're definitely not saying don't do it, um, if that's what you wish to do. I, I think you know, with with obviously your students see words in a book, and they will see the letters, the vowel letters in a book. And they're going to need something in order to pronounce those vowel letters. But, um, for example, the, the difference between seat and sit is so minimal. And you could spend months trying to get your students to make a difference that comes out of my mouth quite naturally as a native speaker, when in fact it wouldn't really be necessary that they make a quality difference there. However, there is a length difference between those two, and that's something that could be worked on more usefully. Your students will need vowels. You can't not teach the vowels because if you don't, most of them will read the word as the letters. So again, my Spanish students will see two vowel letters and they will pronounce two vowel letters. And the word read becomes read. And read mm, probably wouldn't be understood. No, maybe, so maybe I not. I was wanting to say E and they would say something slightly different to what I do because they would say the Spanish equivalent sound. But that Spanish equivalent sound would be sufficient as long as they weren't, and, and, and things like talk, you know, if they say, Pah, that's not going to work. So you say, no, no, it's it's all. And you, you get them to make a sound. Will they make the sound I make? No. They make something closer to O. Oh. That's fine. They're not saying taut. Um, let's say taught or close to yeah. so yeah we, you do need to teach uh, qualities of a vowel but you don't need to spend ages and ages and ages failing to get them to make the exact quality a native speaker would make absolutely um and on on the topic of vowels um i will just i will just flag up one last time we've got a sample a link to a sample chapter down in the comments uh, and that sample chapter is on vowels um, and it will give you a real a real taste of what's in the book. So do go fill out that form, get that sample chapter if you want to, if you want to find out more. Um, I think we're probably going to have to wrap up there. Um, there's so many comments which we've not managed to get to. Wow. You guys are all yeah. really engaged. Um, and like, I, 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 you really clearly care a lot about this topic. And it's really great to see that. Um, so I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll run another event on this, um, just seeing all of that. Um, Robin and Gemma, thank you so much. Um, just before we sign off, do you have any any sort of final comments or anything you'd like to like to say? I would just like to say to teachers, go and teach pronunciation, mm. because the, you you will make mistakes, 
And you look back as I look back now over 40 years in the classroom and think, oh my God, did I do that? Fine, but at least you did it. Because by teaching pronunciation, you show concern for pronunciation. And your students, in the end, will get out into the real world, having been given some sort of background and some sort of motivation. And if there are issues that through your teaching, which wasn't at its best that day, they've got wrong, it'll sort itself out. If you don't teach pronunciation, you're really giving them a very, very shaky foundation for the rest of what they do in, in, in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I have time, do I have time to say one yeah, thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so just to, to finish up, um, and Robin mentioned it before, so much of what we've talked about in the book has come from our experience in IATFL pronunciation SIG, also called PRONSIG. Um, so if the topics in the book interest you, please do go over to the IATFL PRONSIG website. We do lots of things, all of which um, has very, very similar kind of themes to what we talk about. And um, we'd uh, love to see you. And it's great to see the enthusiasm for pronunciation as well. Gemma, we said the other day when we were chatting that the, the Pronsig had changed our lives completely. Yeah. yeah, this book wouldn't have existed. We wouldn't have written this book together if it wasn't for, for IATFL Pronsig. Um, it's a wonderful community. So if you're interested in pronunciation, you'd like more input, then please do come over and join us. We're on all social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. We have a website as well. So um, uh, yeah, we'd be happy to have you. Excellent, excellent. Um, and actually, on, on the topic of Pronsig and, Pronsig and IATEFL, um, we're going to be at IATEFL talking about yes. pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I believe we are also having a book signing. So if you have the book oh. and you're at IATEFL, um, come along. Um, so at least I, I, I think we do. I hope I'm not promising that. <laughs> and you guys haven't heard about it yet. We're, we're happy to be there. It's fabulous. Okay, okay good. good. You're, you're invited to meet teachers. So <laughs> with, with that signing book, it's just fabulous when teachers come up and talk to you. Their colleagues, it's being with colleagues talking about what really matters a lot to us. So it's fabulous. Wonderful. Um, right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm 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 going to let you all go back to your lives now. We've 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 kept you a bit longer than we planned to. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, Robin and Gemma. It's been really interesting talking to you. Yeah, and thank you, everyone, thank you, everyone, for your questions and your comments. It's been really great to see how how much you enjoy this topic. Um, so just just to sign us off, um, if you've liked this live session today, um, make sure you like it. If you love this live session, make sure you love it. Um, and please do share it as well. Um, if you know a teacher who needs this in their lives, then tag them in the comments. Um, and this really does help us out. Um, we also want to make these sessions all about you, our teaching community. So do comment and tell us what you'd like us to talk about next. If you want more on pronunciation, tell us that. If you want other topics, let us know. Um, and make sure you're following us as well so you don't miss any of the sessions we've got coming up. Um, we're at OUP ELT Global on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, and don't forget to check out the book and check out the sample chapter. The links will be in the comments. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, but last but not least, a huge thank you to you, Robin and Gemma. It's been absolutely great having you here. I've had so much fun. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, pleasure. everyone. Yeah, thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.